that different in equivalent. We take a pile of k and p are distinct integers, and I might as well say k is bigger than p. Then if I look at the position k bar circle p bar, in one move, I can reduce the k down to p and make it this in one move. And this is a winning position because it's symmetrical. Therefore, this is a losing position. Therefore, k wiggle is inequivalent to p, k bar is inequivalent to p bar. And that shows, therefore, that the different nim piles all appear in different equivalence classes for this operation. On the other hand, it's much more interesting and much harder to prove, but it is true, that there really is a nim pile in every equivalence class. And let me show you how you prove that. Let A be a position. OK, let B1 up to BK be all of the positions which you can reach in one step. You can reach in one move from A. I claim that one of these positions is a winning position. One of these, I claim, is a winning position. I have to prove that. Of course, I don't know very much, so I'm not going to be able to give you an explicit description of which one. I shall show only prove it by an indirect argument. Suppose this is false, then. So I'll suppose that they're all losing temporarily. That means that given any one of these positions, say A circle P bar, that there is a single move which makes it a winning position. Now, it's clear that that move does not consist of reducing this part, because then the, there would be a winning position in this list. So that move will have to consist of moving it to a position C sub P circle P bar, namely a move out of it from A to something or other. Now, in this way, I get myself some position C naught, C1, up to C sub K. And there seem to be K plus 1 distinct positions, but we already decided there are only K distinct positions starting from position A. So there's a duplication here. That means that somewhere we find C sub P equals C sub N, for some P not equal to N. But of course, P is equivalent, P bar is equivalent to C P. And N bar is equivalent to N bar. Remember how we chose these. We chose it so that this is a winning position. That means C P is equivalent to P bar. C N is equivalent to N bar. And of course, this is a contradiction, because here I have P bar equivalent to n bar. And we know that different nim piles are different. And this contradiction goes back to the assumption that these are all losing positions. Therefore, one of them must be a winning position. And then that tells us, in conjunction with our first statement, that we have theorem 8, which says every equivalence class of Wiggle contains exactly one nim pile. Not more than one, not less than one, exactly one. Now, it's desirable to have a name for the numbers that we get in this fashion, and I'll call those the class number. So if I'm given a position A, I know that there is a certain integer P bar such that this is true. And this number P, I shall call a class of A. That'll be, call it the class number of A. It's the number which represents the equivalence class that it's in. So I'll write that down as a formal definition. The class number of a position A is the integer P for which A is equivalent to P bar. And we'll call that N of A. Now, unfortunately, the class numbers we've gotten by indirect argument. And it would be nice to have some fairly explicit way of finding out what they are. Of course, that's the whole point in some sense. And I'd like to give you a fairly dis explicit description of how you could get them by an analysis similar to the one and lost analysis that we've already made. Let me state the facts first as follows. Uh, given the position A, we start with the positions N1 up, B1 up to BK, 
which are all the positions you can get to in one step. And I'm going to say let Q be the least integer. Not in n of b1, n of b2, n of bk. I want you to imagine that we're calculating these things by working our way up from the bottom so that we already know what all these numbers are. And then I claim that we could calculate what the smallest, of course, non-negative integer here, which does not appear in this list. And I claim then n of a equals q. So this gives an explicit way of calculating. Now let me prove that this is true. It's very easy. Supposing I start in position a circle q bar. That means that I claim as a winning position. That means that I want to show how I can win if it's my opponent's turn to play from this position. Well, he has two kinds of moves. He might move by reducing this, where p is less than q. Well, that means p is a non-negative integer, which is smaller than q, and therefore it's an integer in this list. Suppose p equals n of b sub i. Then, of course, I immediately move and change this to b sub i, circle p bar, which I know to be a winning position, so this must have been a losing position. On the other hand, he might make another kind of move, which is to say he could move from here to something that looked like b sub j, circle uh, q bar. Well, now, the class number of b sub j is in this list, and therefore it isn't q. Therefore, these two are not equivalent, and therefore, this is a losing position. So whatever he moves, it's a losing position. So therefore, this must be a winning position, and that proves what I claimed. Here. Let's actually see how we could do that on an actual graph. Now let's see how this works on the graph that we looked at once before. Here at the bottom is a winning position. Of course, it communicates to no place at all, and the least integer missing is zero, which is what a winning position has to have anyhow. Over here is another endpoint. It's a winning position, and its class number is zero. This position here communicates ahead to a position marked zero, and so the least integer it does not communicate to is a 1. Here, we have one that communicates to two different positions, both of which are 0. The least integer missing is 1. Here, we only have one choice. It goes to a 0, and the first integer missing is a 1. This position up here communicates to two different things, but they're both marked 1, and the first integer missing is a 0. Here, we have a position which communicates to a 1 and to a 0 and to no other numbers, and the first integer missing is a 2. Here's a position which communicates to two different 1s, but not to a 0, so the least integer missing is a 0. Here, we have something that communicates to a 0 and a 2. The least integer missing is a 1, so we mark this one 1. Here is something that communicates to a 0 and a 1, and the least integer missing is a 2. We mark it 2. And finally, this last one communicates already to a 0 and to a 1 and to a 2, but not to anything higher, so the least integer missing is a 3. Now you can see how we could work this all the way back up a graph. Let's note how this compares with what we did before. The positions marked 0 here are the positions we previously marked w, of course, because a winning position has class number 0. But in addition, the places previously marked with an L have now been marked with numbers, and this amounts, therefore, to a finer analysis of the nature of losing positions. Now, I would like to read out one little corollary of this argument. You can also get it from the other argument of existence that tells us how big this integer might be. You can see right away that there are only k integers here at most. They might not be all different. But even if they were all different, the smallest integer missing what couldn't be any bigger than k. You see, it could, these could only be at best 0 through k minus 1. So we get the interesting conclusion n of a is less than or equal to k, where this number k is the number of distinct positions here. So let's record that because it becomes important a little later.
Theorem 9, n of a is less than or equal to the number of distinct moves possible from the position a. We'll need that in a moment. Now, the next thing we'd like to do is transfer everything from this ghastly algebra of equivalence classes directly to integers where we can get at them. And we know how to do it now. For every equivalence class, we have an integer. And we just want to transfer this. And I'll use a different operation symbol now. I'll use star to represent the operation on integers. And let's look how it actually goes. If I'm given an integer k, I want to define k and another integer g, and I want to define k star g. That's going to be the class number of the nim position equivalence class obtaining containing this nim position. Now let's see if that's what we really want to do. See if I start with an equivalence class script k, another equivalence class script g, whose class numbers are respectively this and this. That means that in here is the nim pile k bar. And in here is the nim pile g bar. And if I want to calculate this, I get it by finding the equivalence class of that. And the number that I attach to this thing, of course, is n of this thing. In other words, it's this. So the number that's attached to this is, in fact, k star g. And now, of course, from what I've already said, then, we know that this star operation makes a group out of the non-negative integers. We know that that's true up here. We know that every one of these things has a number attached to it uniquely, so that the circle operation, which is a group operation in this collect collection of equivalence classes, is now the star operation on the collection of non-negative integers. And it makes a group out of them. Now we want to know a little more about this group. And the essential thing comes from this last theorem about, about the number of distinct moves right there. You see, if we consider this position here, k roof, k bar, circle, g bar, how many moves can we make here? Well, this pile we could reduce in k different ways. We could take any number of from 1 to k off this pile, or we could reduce this pile by any number from 1 to g. So that the total number of distinct possible moves here is at most k plus g. So therefore, we know this inequality, that the star operation is less than or equal to the plus operation, where this is the ordinary arithmetic plus now. This is our first link of the star to arithmetic, you see. So let's write some of this up on the board in case we want to look at it again. We have star as the operation on the non-negative integers given by k star p is n of k bar circle p bar. That's definition three. And now comes the really important theorem of this subject, which I shall put up right away so we can get a look at it before we start. There is a unique group operation star on the non-negative integers, which satisfies these two conditions. First, that it satisfies this inequality. And second, every element has order two. You remember that every element does have order two in the group we're talking about. So when we prove this theorem, it will be true that we've shown that the group is completely determined. When we find out what this group is, we'll know all about the NIM group. As an additional wrinkle on this theorem, I toss in this interesting fact, that for this particular operation star, p less than 2 to the power n implies that the star operation in this case, with 2 to the n here, coincides with the plus operation. 2 to the n star p is the 2 to the n plus p, provided now p is less than 2 to the power n. This is the fundamental link of a more tight character than this one you see connecting the star with the plus. Now, this is an interesting theorem, and we're going to prove it in this form. And we're not going to actually make use of anything about the game. We're just going to make use of these two hypotheses and the fact that it's a group. Now, the proof of this is a little bit long-winded. And it depends essentially on proving two things simultaneously. One, let's define S sub n to be the set of integers from 0 on up to 1 less than a power of 2. So counting 0, that's the first 2 to the power n integers. 
That's S sub n. And then the next statement we want to prove is that P belongs to S sub n implies 2 to the n star P is equal to P 2 to the n plus P. This hypothesis here, of course, is exactly the same as this hypothesis. It's just another way of saying it for convenience. Now, the formal proof of these two statements proceeds by induction on the integer n. But let's just see how this goes. Let's start out and look and see what 0 star 0 is. Well, the fundamental inequality says it's less than or equal to 0. But there isn't any non-negative integer which fills the bill except 0 itself, so it's actually equal to 0. And then this equation shows that 0 must be the identity element in this group. Of course, we knew that for the NIM group, but we're now doing it from scratch. So let's record this now on this little group table. 0 goes there. This is the identity. And since it's the identity, we can fill in this entire row. On out to infinity. Like that. And notice while we're at it, that right up here is S sub 0, and it's a subgroup. It consists of just one element, namely 0. So we prove this statement for the 0 case. Now let's look at the next situation. Well, we already know that 1 star 1 is 0, because 1 star 1 is every element of order 2, remember, in this group. So we know this is the identity element goes there. And now you see the fact that everything in this row appears permuted like that shows that this is a little subgroup again. And it establishes this statement that this is a subgroup. for n equal to 1. Now let's take a look at what goes here in the table. The essential thing we need to know here is that in a group table, you don't have any duplications. There's never the same element appears in the twice in any row or column. So the element that goes here certainly isn't 0, because 0 appears in this row. And it isn't 1. And it isn't 2. But the inequality says it's less than or equal to 3, so there isn't much left for it to be except 3. Of course, I can make the same argument over here, or I can make the argument that says that in, in any group in which every element's of order 2, the group's abelian, in which case I know right away that 1 star 2 and 2 star 1 have to be the same. And of course, I know what this element is, because 2 star 2 is 0. Now let's look and see what goes there. Well, I have 1 star 3. That's what I'm looking for. I already know that that's 1 star 1 star 2 because 1 star 2 is 3 by what we've already computed. And now the 1's because every element's ordered 2, and so I see that that's 2, and I can just enter that right there. And of course, commutativity over there. And now I can do the same way. Let's look at 2 star 3. 2 star 3 is 2, star 1 star 2. It's commutative, gives me a 1 here. And this element's a 0. And now you see, again, we have every element appearing in this little row again, these rows. So this is a subgroup, and we have along here. 0 star 2 is 2, 1 star 2 is 3. It adds, in other words, in those cases. Now let's just look and see what goes down here. Well, we make our, our no nothing left argument again. 0, 1, 2, 3 are already used in this row. We can't have them here in plus 4, so it has to be 5. And here's 0, 1, 2, 3. 4 and 5 are already missing already used, so we have to have nothing bigger than a 6. It is actually a 6. And here it's a 7. And now you see what we've done. We've actually verified this statement here, running down this column. And now, let's see how you do this, how you go on without filling in the entire table, which you could do if you wanted. It goes like this. What we've said now is that this set is actually a coset of S2. And now in a group in which every element's of order 2, if you take any subgroup and any of its cosets and take their union, you get a new subgroup. In other words, S3 is a subgroup. So I'll just fill that fact in like this. 
and write subgroup here without bothering to fill it in any farther. And now let's see how it would go down the next line here. Well, even if I don't bother to fill this in, I know in this subgroup that all the numbers from 0 through 7 are going to occur somewhere in this line. And 8's already eliminated. And I can't go higher than 1 plus 8 is 9, so this has got to be a 9. Now look at the next row. The numbers up to 7 are all eliminated already. We don't know where they are in this row, but they're there somewhere. 8 and 9 are eliminated. This must be 10, you see, and it's adding up the way it's supposed to go. In every row, I'll eliminate all the numbers from 0 through 7 because it's a subgroup. Every element appears once in every row, in the row, for a subgroup. And then I'll eliminate all the previous numbers up to here, and I get 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15, showing that the next block of eight integers is, in fact, a coset of this subgroup, S3, and that shows that S4 is a subgroup, and so on. Now, of course, if I wanted to do this very formally, I should use mathematical induction. But after all, mathematical induction is just a fancy way of saying and so on. And so we can assume that these statements are true. And now to actually finish the theorem, you see I've proved almost everything about the theorem. I've proved this statement, but I haven't really proved the operation is unique. I'll just show you how you can easily see that it is unique, because with this, I can calculate anything. And just to illustrate that, Let's calculate this, 5 star 11. First, I note that 5 is 4 plus 1, so I write that as 1 star 4 using this result here. And then I note that 11 is 3 plus 8. And again, I have a number smaller than the power of 2, so I can write that as 8 star 3, like that. And now I apply this result again. 3 can be represented as the power of 2 plus a smaller number which means that it's 8 star 2, star 1, star 1, star 4. And now the 1's cancel, because every element's of order 2. And now I can use this theorem to button things back up. The 2 star the 4 by the theorem is 6. It adds in that case. And then the 6 star the 8, that's putting the 2 and 4 together. 6 star 8 now is 14. And that tells me what I wanted to know. And I think you can see how we could, in fact, get anything by reiterated operation along these lines. Let me show you how this calculation goes by the rule that's usually given for calculation of this star operation for NIM. You start out by writing a 5 in its binary form as 1, 4, plus no 2s, plus 1, 1. And then you write the number 11 in its binary form as 1, 8, plus no fours plus one, two, plus one, one. And that's just what we did, of course. And then these canceled. And then what's left, we go back together. It means the binary expansion of the number we have at the end is this. And of course, that is 14. So in fact, this reduces right away to the classical game of NIM, as explained in many books. Now, what we've said, then, is that knowledge of the star operation is complete now. And, of course, the star operation tells us exactly how to play ordinary NIM. Because if you have the star operation, you can look at any situation in ordinary NIM. You can calculate whether it's a winning position or a losing position by using the star operation. And then you can adjust your play suitably according to that. Actually, you can find a little rule, which we won't go into right here, which tells you, makes it easy to find the winning play in case it is not a winning position presented to you. If, it, if you find yourself playing from a losing position, it's easier to find the winning position and trying everything. But we don't have to worry about that. Let's see what this situation can do for us in the old Rip Van Winkle game. Let's go back and see the situation that confronted old Rip at the beginning of the game. The first dwarf had knocked down this one pin, and now you see he's in this situation. He's got a single pin over here, which is isolated from the others. There's nothing, what happens here is independent of what happens over here. So this is a position in a game, which is in fact a product. It's a circle combination of a position consisting of one thing here and 11 things there. Now, I'll designate a position, just the position corresponding to those 11 in a row as 11 roof. And of course, the other part of the position is one roof. And the position overall, then, is this one. And now I'd like to know, how can we use class numbers to help us 
tell Rip what to do. Well, what we need to know, of course, is what are the class numbers of these roof positions? Well, we can find them by recursion. And here's a chart in which I've gotten started. I think it's obvious that zero roof is the same as no NIM mat counters. One roof, two roof, three roof turn out to have these class numbers. Four roof isn't four, but it turns out to be one. Let's just show how we get the next one, and then we can see how this thing works in general. So if we start from a position five roof, how do we find all the possibilities? Let's just look at the pins here for a minute. Let's look at the position five roof. Here it is. What are the possible moves? Well, I could take one from the end, and that would make the position four roof. Or I could take one from here, making a position one roof, circle three roof. I could take one from the middle, making two roof, circle two roof. Or I could take two pins out. If I take two from the end, I get three roof. If I take three from the, more or less the middle, I get one roof, circle two roof. And the moves that I haven't looked at are the same symmetrically. So the other possibilities are three roof, and one roof, circle two roof. And these are the only possible things I can get to. Now you see, presumably if I already calculated on that chart over there, what the class numbers for each of these are. So, the class number of this is one. I couldn't say equals. The class number of this is one star now, three. Using the fact that the class number of this is one, class number of this is three, and the circle turns over into the star operation. Class number of this is two, star two. Class number of this is three. Class number of this is one, star two. And I know how to calculate stars. This happens to be two, this is zero, this is three, this is three. Now I look through this list. I've already got zero and one and two and three. My rule was that the first number I don't have is the class number. The new class number, therefore, is four. I have n of five roof equals four. And so it's a fairly simple calculation by recursion to find this out. Let's record this on the chart over here. Five roof is four by the calculation we just made. And if you make quite a few more calculations along the same lines, you find that here are the class numbers for the remaining positions. So then going back to where Rip Van Winkle stood, we have the class number of 11 is six. So as far as Rip is concerned, he might as well be playing Nim in the following position. Namely, the 11 roof is equivalent to a pile of six Nim counters. The one roof is equivalent to a pile of one Nim counter. And he might as well be playing Nim in this position. Of course, you know what you want to do in this position. In Nim, you would like to reduce this to a one, which means he would like to make a move here, which reduces the, the value of the class number to one. We know from the way it was calculated, this is possible. I haven't got the work on the board, so we can't see it directly. But it is true that he can get it by going to three roof, circle seven roof. And we can check that, because three roof, according to our chart over here, has class number three. And seven roof has class number two. So this thing has class number three star two. Three star two, that's the ordinary NIM calculation, is one. So this combination has class number one. And therefore, when we, he makes this move over here, he winds up in this position with counters three and three, a string of three, a string of seven, a string of one. And this is a winning position. Of course, there are two ways to get there. You can take the fourth pin out from either end of the long string. And that gets it for you. Now we can see, I think, exactly where this theory does something for us. You see. In the game where everything begins as being a product of something very simple. In that case, the star operation tells us right away what to do. That's ordinary nim. In this situation, when we have this long string of 11, that's not a product of any two smaller positions. But nevertheless, it becomes one in a convenient way when I take out a middle position. If I take out a middle counter, this suddenly breaks into a product. And therefore, the star operation makes it easy to analyze the structure of the oriented graph corresponding to this situation. And we can see then that the star operation will help us when the game naturally dissolves into disjoint graphs in some way. 
And we can see now also why it won't do us any good in chess, for example. Because while we could calculate all these things, chess positions essentially never are representable as the direct product of two smaller positions. And so, of course, it won't do you very much good. There's just one little thing I would like to say about this Rip Van Winkle game. When I first found this interesting sequence of numbers, I looked at it pretty hard. And I tried to find out what made it tick. And how does it go? It seems sort of ragged and doesn't seem to have any particular nice properties. And I calculated quite a ways. And the one thing that did strike me was that I found a 1 under 4. And the next power of 2, I cropped up on another 1. When I got up to 16, there was still another 1. And so I said, gee, that sounds curious. So I calculated to 32. And there it was. It was a 1 when I got up there. And I had no reason to understand why that was so. The numbers are all very ragged. They're here and there, they just pop up and down, 5, 6, 4, 3, and so on. On you go, but you get to a 1 when you get to 32. So I made a superhuman calculation, and it gets to be quite a bit of work to calculate all the way to 64. And sure enough, when I got to 64, there it was. It was a 1 again. Still no rhyme or reason to the sequence. And of course, I gave up at this point. I didn't have that much time to go to 128. But I mentioned this once in a lecture at Caltech. And shortly thereafter, I got a letter from some students who said, we put this on a computer. So they turned it on in a computer. And the computer, of course, can run through this in no time at all. And the computer ran it out to several hundred. And what do you suppose they discovered? They discovered that starting in position 72, the sequence becomes periodic with a period of 12. Now, that, of course, only was true up to 500 as far as the computer was concerned. But it isn't at all hard to prove that once it's been periodic for a reasonable number of times, then it will, in fact, continue to be periodic forever. So that we now know that it is, in fact, periodic forever. And the odd thing about it is that every time you come to a power of 2, you really do come back to 1. But there's still no particular reason that I know of to understand why that's true. Thank you.